I suppose you'll be getting away pretty soon now full time is over, Professor, said a person not in the story to the Professor of Ontography, soon after they sat down next to each other at a feast in the hospitable hall of St James's College. The Professor was young, neat and precise in speech. Yes, he said. My friends have been making me take up golf this term, and I mean to go to the East Coast. In point of fact, to Burnstow, I dare say you know it, for a week or ten days to improve my game. I hope to get off tomorrow. Ah, Parkins, said his neighbour on the other side. If you're going to Burnstow, I wish you'd look at the site of the Templar's Preceptory, and let me know if you think it would be any good to have a dig there in the summer. It was, as you might suppose, a person of antiquarian pursuits who said this, but since he merely appears in this prologue, there's no need to give his entitlement. Certainly, said Parkins to the professor. Uh, if you'll describe to me whereabouts the site is, I'll do my best to give you an idea of the lie of the land when I get back. Or I could write to you about it, if you'd tell me where you're likely to be. Oh, don't trouble to do that, thanks. It it's only I'm thinking of taking my family there in that direction in the long, and it occurred to me that, as very few of the English preceptories have been properly planned, I might have an opportunity of doing something useful on off days. The professor rather sniffed at the idea that planning out a preceptory could be described as useful. His neighbour continued. The site, well, I doubt if there's anything showing above ground, must be down quite close to the beach now. The seas encroach tremendously, as you know, all along that bit of coast. I should think from the map it must be about oh, three quarters of a mile from the Globe Inn, at the north end of the town. Where are you going to stay? Well, at the Globe, as a matter of fact, said Parkins. Uh, I've engaged a room there. I couldn't get in anywhere else. Most of the lodging houses are shut up in the winter, it seems, and as it is, they tell me that the only room of any size I can have is really a double-bedded one, and that they haven't a corner in which to store the other bed and so on. Uh, but I must have a fairly large room, for I'm taking some books down, and I mean to do quite a bit of work. And though I don't quite fancy having an empty bed, not to speak of two in what I might call my study, I suppose I can manage to rough it for the short time I shall be there. Do you call having an extra bed in your room roughing it, Parkins? <laughs> said a bluff person opposite. Look here, I shall come down and occupy it for a bit. Uh, I'll be company for you. The professor quivered, but managed to laugh in a courteous manner. <laughs> By all means, Rogers, uh, there's nothing I should like better, but I'm afraid you'd find it rather dull. You don't play golf, do you? No, thank heavens, said rude Mr Rogers. Well, you see, when I'm not working, I shall most likely be out on the links, and that, as they say, would be rather dull for you, I'm afraid. Oh, I don't know. There's certain to be someone I know of in the place, but of course, if you don't want me, speak the word, Parkins. I shan't be offended. Truth as you always tell us, is never offensive. Parkins was, indeed, scrupulously polite and strictly truthful. Uh, it's to be feared that Mr Rogers sometimes practised upon this knowledge of those characteristics. In Parkins' breast there was a conflict now raging, which for a moment or two did not allow him to answer. That interval being over, he said, well, if you want the exact truth, Rogers, I was considering whether the room I speak of would really be large enough to accommodate us both comfortably, and also whether, mind, I shouldn't have said this if you hadn't have pressed me, you would not constitute something in the nature of a hindrance to my work. Rogers laughed loudly. <laughs> well done, Parkins, he said. It's all right. Promise not to interrupt your work. Don't you disturb yourself about that. No, I won't come if you don't want me, but I thought I should do so nicely to keep the ghosts off. Here he might have been seen to wink and to nudge his next neighbour. Parkins might also have been to seen to become pink. I beg your pardon? Rogers continued. I, I oughtn't to have said that. I forgot you don't like levity on that topic. Well, said Parkins. As you have mentioned the matter, I freely own that I do not like careless talk about what you call ghosts. A man in my position, he went on, raising his voice a little, cannot, I find, be too careful about appearing to sanction the current beliefs on such subjects, 
as you know, Rogers, or as you ought to know, for I think I have never concealed my views... No, you certainly have not put in Rogers, sotto voce. I hold that any semblance, any appearance of concession to the view that such things might exist is equivalent to a renunciation of all that I hold most sacred. But, but I'm afraid I've not succeeded in securing your attention. Your undivided attention was what Dr. Blimber actually said. Rogers interrupted with every appearance of an earnest desire for accuracy. But I beg your pardon, Parkins, I'm, I'm stopping you. No. Not at all, said Parkins. I don't remember Blimper. Perhaps he was before my time, but I needn't go on. I'm sure you know what I mean. Yes, yes, said Rogers rather hastily. Just so. We'll go into it fully at Burnstow or somewhere. In repeating the above dialogue, I've tried to give the impression which it made on me that Parkins was something of an old woman, rather hen-like perhaps in his little ways, totally destitute, alas, of a sense of humour but at the same time dauntless and sincere in his convictions, and a man deserving of the greatest respect. Whether or not the reader has gathered so much, that was the character which Parkins had. On the following day, Parkins did, as he had hoped, succeed in getting away from his college and in arriving at Burnstow. He was made welcome at the Globe Inn, safely installed in a large double-bedded room, of which we have heard, and was able before retiring to rest, to arrange his materials for work in apple pie order upon a commodious table which occupied the outer end of the room and was surrounded on three sides by windows looking out seaward. That is to say, the central window looked straight out to sea and those on the left and the right commanded prospects along the shore to the north and south respectively. On the south you saw the village of Burnstow. On the north no houses were to be seen, only the beach and the low cliff backing it. Immediately in front was a strip, not considerable, of rough grass, dotted with old anchors, capstans and so forth, and then a broad path, and then the beach. Whatever may have been the original distance between the Globin and the sea, not more than 60 yards now separated them. The rest of the population of the inn was, of course, a golfing one, and included few elements that call for special description. The most conspicuous figure was perhaps that of an ancient militaire, secretary of a London club, and possessed of a voice of incredible strength and of views of pronouncedly Protestant type. They were apt to find utterance after his attendance upon the ministrations of the vicar, an estimable man with inclinations towards a picturesque ritual which he gallantly kept down as far as he could out of deference to East Anglian tradition. Professor Parkins, one of whose principal characteristics was pluck, spent the greater part of the day following his arrival at Burnstow in what he called improving his game in company with this Colonel Wilson. And during the afternoon, whether the process of improvement were to blame or not, I'm not sure, the Colonel's demeanour assumed a colouring so lurid that even Parkins jibbed at the thought of walking home with him from the links. He determined, after a short and furtive look at that bristling moustache and the uh, incardined features, that it would be wiser to allow the influences of tea and tobacco to do what they could with the Colonel before the dinner hour should render a meeting inevitable. I might walk home tonight along the beach, he reflected. Yes, and, and take a look. There'll be light enough for that, at the ruins of which Disney was talking. I, I don't exactly know where they are, by the way, but I, I expect I can hardly help stumbling upon them. This he accomplished, I may say, in the most literal sense. For in picking his way from the links to the shingle beach, his foot caught partly in a gorse root and partly in a biggish stone, and over he went. When he got up and surveyed his surroundings, he found himself in a patch of somewhat broken ground, covered with small depressions and mounds. These latter, when he came to examine them, proved to be simply masses of flints embedded in mortar and grown over with turf. He must, he rightly concluded, be on the site of the preceptory he'd promised to look at. It seemed not unlikely to reward the spade of the explorer, Enough of the foundations was probably left at no great depth to throw a good deal of light on the general plan. He remembered vaguely that the Templars, to whom this site 
had belonged, were in the habit of building round churches, and he thought a particular series of humps or mounds near him did appear to be arranged in something of a circular form. Few people can resist the temptation to try a little amateur research in a department quite outside their own, if only for the satisfaction of showing how successful they would have been had they only have taken it up seriously. Our professor, however, if he felt something of this mean desire, was also truly anxious to oblige Mr Disney. So he paced with care the circular area he had noticed and wrote down its rough dimensions in his pocketbook. Then he proceeded to examine an oblong eminence which lay east of the centre of the circle and seemed to his thinking likely to be the base of a, a platform or altar. At one end of it, the northern, a, a patch of the turf was gone, removed by some boy or other creature force nature. It might, he thought, be as well to, to probe the soil here for evidences of masonry. And he took out his knife and began scraping away at the earth. And now, now followed another little discovery. A portion of soil fell inward as he scraped and disclosed a small cavity. He lighted one match after another to help him see of what nature the hole was, but the wind was too strong for them all. By tapping and scratching the sides with his knife, however, he was able to make out that it must be an artificial hole in the masonry. It was rectangular, and the sides top and bottom, if not actually plastered, were smooth and regular. Of course, it was empty. No. As he withdrew the knife, he heard a, a metallic clink. And when he introduced his hand, it met with a cylindrical object lying on the floor of the hole. Well, naturally enough, he picked it up. And when he brought it into the light, which was now fast fading, he could see that it too was of man's making. It's a metal tube about four inches long and evidently of some considerable age. By the time Parkins made sure there was nothing else in this odd receptacle, it was way too late and too dark for him to think of undertaking any further search. What he'd done had proved so unexpectedly interesting that he determined to sacrifice a little more of the daylight on the morrow to archaeology. The object, which he now had safe in his pocket, was bound to be of some slight value at least, he felt sure. Bleak and solemn was the view on which he took a last look before starting homeward. A faint yellow light in the west showed the links, on which a few figures moving towards the clubhouse were still visible. The squat Martello Tower, the lights of Oldsley Village, the pale ribbon of sands intersected at the interval by black wooden groins, the dim and murmuring sea. The wind was bitter from the north, but was at his back when he set out for the globe. He quickly rattled and clashed through the shingle and gained the sand upon which, but for the groins, which had to be got over every few yards, the going was both good and quiet. One last look behind to measure the distance he'd made since leaving the ruined Templar's church showed him a prospect of company on his walk in the shape of a... of a rather indistinct distinct personage, who seemed to be making great efforts to catch up with him, but made little if any progress. I mean that there was the appearance of running about his movements, but that the distance between him and Parkins did not materially seem to lessen. So at least Parkins thought and decided that he almost certainly did not know him, and that it would be absurd to wait until he came to him. For all that company, he began to think, would, would really be very welcome on that lonely shore, if only you could choose your companion. In his unenlightened days, he'd read of meetings in such places, which even now would hardly bear to think of. He went on, thinking of them, however, until he reached home, and particularly one of which catches upon people's fancy at some time of their childhood. Now, I saw in my dream that Christian had gone but a very little way when he saw a foul fiend coming over the field to meet him. What should I do now? 
he thought. If I looked back and caught sight of a black figure sharply defined against the yellow sky and saw that it had horns and wings, I wonder whether I would stand or run for it. Well, luckily the gentleman behind is not of that kind, and he seems to be about as far off now as, as, as when I first saw him. Well, at this rate, he won't get his dinner as soon as I shall. And dear me, it's within quarter of an hour of the time now. I must run. Parkins had, in fact, very little time for dressing. When he met the Colonel at dinner, peace, or as much of her as that gentleman could manage, reigned once more in the military bosom. No, 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 nor was she put to flight in the hours of bridge that followed dinner. For Parkins was a, a more respectable player. When therefore he retired towards twelve o'clock, he felt that he'd spent his evening in quite a satisfactory way, and that even for so long as a fortnight or three weeks, life at the Globe would be supportable under similar conditions. Especially, thought he, if I go on improving my game. As he went along the passengers, he met Mr and Mrs Boots of the Globe, who stopped and said, oh, beg pardon, sir, uh, but I was brushing your coat just now, and there was something fell out the pocket. I put it on your chest of drawers, sir, in your room, sir. A piece of pipe or something like that, I think, sir. Thank you, sir. You'll find it in your chest of drawers, sir. Yeah, good night, sir. The speech served to remind Parkins of his little discovery of that afternoon. It was with some considerable curiosity that he turned it over by the light of his candles. Now, it was of bronze, he now saw, and was shaped very much after the manner of the modern dog whistle in in fact, it was, yes, it certainly was, actually no more nor less than a whistle. He put it to his lips, but it was quite full of a fine caked up sand or earth, which would not yield to knocking. But he must have loosened it with a knife, so... <sighs> Tidy as ever in his habits, Parkins cleared out the earth onto a piece of paper, took the latter to the window to empty it out. Now the night was clear and bright, and he saw when he opened the casement, and he stopped for, for an instant to look at the sea and note a belated wanderer stationed on the shore in front of the inn. And then he shut the window, a little surprised at the late hours people kept at Burnstow, and took his whistle to the light again. Why, surely there were, there were marks on it, not not merely marks, but letters. Well, very little rubbing rendered the deeply cut inscription quite legible. But the professor had to confess, after some earnest thought, that the meaning of it was as obscure to him as the writing on the wall of Balthazar. There were legends, both on the front end and the back of the whistle. The one read thus. Flour, fur, Bis fla, and the other, ki est east ki unit. Well, I ought to be able to make it out, he thought. But I suppose I, I'm a little rusty in my Latin. When I come to think of it, I don't believe I even know the word for a whistle. The long one does seem simple enough. It ought to mean, who is this who is coming? Well, the best way to find out is evidently to whistle for him. He blew tentatively and stopped suddenly. <whistles> Startled, yet pleased at the note that he'd elicited. Well, it had a quality of infinite distance in it, and soft as it was, he, sometime, he somehow felt it must be audible for miles around. It was a sound, too, that seemed to have the power of forming pictures in the brain. He saw quite clearly for a moment a vision of a wide dark expanse at night with a fresh wind blowing in the midst, a lonely figure. How employed he could not tell. Perhaps he would have seen more had not the pictures been broken by the sudden surge of a gust of wind against his casement, so sudden that it made him look up just in time to see the white glint of a seabird's wing somewhere outside, against the dark panes. The sound of the whistle had so fascinated him that he could not help trying it once more. 
this time boldly. The note was little, if at all, louder than before, and repetition broke the illusion. No picture followed, as he'd half hoped it would. But what is this? Goodness, what force of wind can get up in a few minutes? What a tremendous gust! There, I knew the window fastening was no use. Ah, I thought so. Both candles out. It's enough to tear the room to pieces. Well, the first thing was to get the window shut. While you might count twenty, Parkins struggled with the small casement and felt almost as if he were pushing back a sturdy burglar. So strong was the presence. Well, it, sl it slackened all at once and the window banged to and latched itself. Right. Now to relight the candles and see what damage, if any, had been done. No. Nothing seemed amiss. No glass was even broken in the casement. But the noise roused at least one member of the household. For the Colonel was to be heard stumping in his stockinged feet on the floor above and growling. <laughs> well, quickly as it had risen, the wind did not fall at once. On it went, moaning and rushing past the house, at times rising to a cry, so desolate that, as Parkins disinterestingly said, it might, might have made fanciful people feel quite uncomfortable. Even the unimaginative, he thought, after about a quarter of an hour, might be happier without it. Whether it was the wind or the excitement of golf or, or of the researches in the preceptory that kept Parkins awake, he wasn't sure, but awake he remained in any case long enough to fancy, as I'm afraid I often do myself under such conditions, fancy that he was the victim of all manners of fatal disorders. He would lie, counting the beats of his heart, convinced that it would stop every moment. It entertained grave suspicions of his lungs, his brain, his liver, etc. Suspicions which he was sure would, would be dispelled by the return of daylight, but which, even until then, refused to be put aside. He found a little vicarious comfort in the idea that someone else was in the same boat, a near neighbour in the darkness. It was not easy to tell the direction. It was tossing and, and rustling in his bed, too. The next stage was that Parkins shut his eyes and determined to give every sleep a chance. Here again over-excitement asserted itself in another form, that of making pictures. Experto crader. Pictures do come to closed eyes of one trying to sleep, and are often so little to his taste that he must open his eyes and disperse them. Well, Parkin's experience on this occasion was a very distressing one. He found that the picture that presented itself to him was continuous. And when he opened his eyes, of course, it went. But when he shut them once more, it framed itself afresh and acted itself out again, neither quicker nor slower than before. What he saw was this, a long stretch of shore, shingle edged by sand and intersected at short intervals by black groins running down to the water, a scene, in fact, so like that of his afternoon's walk, that in the absence of any landmark, it could, but it could not be distinguished therefrom. The light was obscure, conveying an impression of a gathering storm, late winter evening and a slight cold rain. On this bleak stage at first, no actor was visible. Then in the distance, a bobbing black object appeared. A moment more, and it was a man running, jumping, clambering over the groins. And every few seconds, looking eagerly back, the nearer he came, the more obvious it was that he was not only anxious, but even terribly frightened. Though, though his face was not to be distinguished, he was, moreover, almost at the, at the end of his strength. On he came. Each successive obstacle seemed to cause him more difficulty than the last. 
Will he get over the next one? Thought Parkins. Seems, it seems a little higher than the others. Yes. Half climbing, half throwing himself, he did get over. And fell, all in a heap, on the other side, the side nearest the spectator. There, as if really unable to get up again, he remained crouching under the groin, looking up in an attitude of painful anxiety. So far, no cause whatever for fear of the runner had been shown. But now, there began to be seen, far up the shore, a little flicker of something light-coloured moving to and fro with great swiftness and irregularity. Rapidly growing larger, it too declared itself as a figure in pale, fluttering draperies, ill-defined. There was something about its motion which made Parkins very unwilling to see it at close quarters. It would stop, raise arms, bow itself towards the sand, and then stooping across the beach to the water's edge and back again. And then, rising upright, once more continue its course forward at a speed that was startling and terrifying. The moment came when the pursuer was hovering above from left to right, only a few yards beyond the groin where the runner lay hiding. After two or three ineffectual castings hither and thither, it came to a stop, stood upright, arms raised high and then darted straight forward towards the groin. Well, at this point, at this point, Parkins failed in his resolution to keep his eyes shut. With many misgivings as to the incipient failure of eyesight, overworked brain, excessive smoking and so on, he finally resigned himself to light his candle, get out a book and pass the night waking, rather than be tormented by this persistent panorama which he clearly saw enough could only be a morbid reflection of his walk and his thoughts on that very day. The scraping of a match on a box and the glare of the light must have startled some creature in the night, rats or what not, which he heard scurry across the floor from the side of his bed with much rustling. Dear, 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 the match is out, fool that it is. But the second one burnt better, and a candle and a book were duly procured, over which Parkins poured till sleep of a wholesome kind came upon him, and that in no longer space. For about the first time in his orderly and prudent life, he forgot to blow out the candle. And when he was called next morning at, at eight, there was still a flicker in the socket, and a sad mess of guttered grease on the top of the little table. After breakfast he was in his room, putting the finishing touches to his golfing costume. Fortune had again allotted the colonel to him for a partner, when one of the maids came in. Oh, if you please, she said, would you like any extra blankets on your bed, sir? Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, said Parkins. Yes, yes, I, I think I should like one. It seems likely to turn rather colder. In a very short time the maid was back with the blanket. Which bed should I put it on, sir? What? Oh. Uh, why, that one, the one I slept in last night, he said, pointing to it. Oh, yes. Beg pardon, sir. Uh, but you seem to have tried them both, lest ways. Uh, we had to make them both up this morning. Really? Uh, very absurd, said Parkins. I certainly never touched the other except to lay some things on it. Did, did it actually seem to have been slept in? Oh, yes, sir said the maid, while the things was crumpled and thrown about always. Right, if you'll excuse me, sir, if anyone hadn't passed, like they'd passed a very poor night, sir. Dear me, said Parkins. Um, well, I, I, I may have disordered it more than I thought when I unpacked my things. I'm, I'm very sorry to have given you the extra trouble, I'm sure. Uh, I expect a friend of mine, by the way, a gentleman from Cambridge, to come and occupy it for a night or two. That, that will be all right. I suppose, won't it? Oh, to be sure, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's no trouble, I'm sure, said the maid, and departed to giggle with her colleagues. Parkins set forth with stern determination to improve his game. Well, I'm glad to be able to report that he succeeded so far in that enterprise that the Colonel, uh, who'd been rather repining at the prospect of a second day's play in his company, became quite chatty as the morning advanced 
and his voice boomed out over the flats, as certain also of our own minor poets have said, like some great bourbon in a minster tower. Extraordinary wind that we had last night, he said. In my old home, we should have said someone had been whistling for it. Should you indeed, said Parkins. Is, is there a superstition of that kind still current in your part of the country? I don't know about superstition, said the Colonel. They believe in it all over, Denmark, Norway, as well as on the Yorkshire coast. And in my experience, mind you, uh, there's generally something at the bottom of what these country folk hold to and have held to for generations. But it's your drive, or whatever it might have been, the golfing reader will have to imagine appropriate digressions at the proper intervals. When the conversation was resumed, Parkins said with a slight hesitancy, um, Apropos of what you were saying just now, Colonel, I think I ought to tell you that my own views on such subjects are very strong. I am, in fact, a convinced disbeliever in what's called the supernatural. What? said the Colonel. Do you mean to tell me you don't believe in second sight or ghosts or anything of the kind? In nothing whatsoever of the kind, returned Parkins firmly. Well said the Colonel. It appears to me at any rate, sir, that you must be little better than a Sadducee. Parkins was on the point of answering that. In his opinion, the Sadducees were the most sensible persons he had ever read of the Old Testament. But feeling some doubts as to whether much mention of them was to be found in that work, he preferred to laugh the accusation off. Well, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps I am, he said. But, here, give me the cheek, boy. Excuse me one moment, Colonel. A short interval. Now, as to the whistling for the wind, let me give you my theory about it. The laws which govern winds are really not at all perfectly known to fisher folk, and such, of course, not known at all. A man or woman of eccentric habits, perhaps, or a stranger, is seen repeatedly on the beach at some unusual hour and is heard whistling. Soon afterwards, a violent wind rises. A man who could read the sky perfectly, who's possessed a barometer, could have foretold that it would. But the simple the simple people of a fishing village have no barometers, and only a few rough rules for prophesying weather. What's more natural uh, th than, than the eccentric personage I postulated should be regarded as having raised the wind, or that he or she should clutch eagerly at their reputation as being able to do so? Now, you take last night's wind. As it happens, I myself was whistling. I blew a whistle twice and the wind seemed to come absolutely in answer to my call. If anyone had seen me, well, the audience had been a little restive under this harangue, and Parkins had, I fear, fallen somewhat into the tone of a lecturer. But at the last sentence, the Colonel stopped. Whistling, were you? He said, and what sort of whistle did you use? Play this stroke first, interval. Well, about that whistle you were asking, Colonel, it's rather a curious one. I have it in my, um, oh, no, no, I, I, I see I left it in my room. As a matter of fact, I found it yesterday. And then Parkins narrated the manner of his discovery of the whistle. Well, upon hearing, which the Colonel grunted and opined that in Parkins' blaze, he should himself be very careful about using a thing that belonged to a set of papists, of whom, speaking generally, it might be affirmed that, well, you never know what they may or may not have been up to. From this topic, he diverged from the enormities of the vicar, who had given notice on the previous Sunday that Friday would be the feast of St Thomas the Apostle, and that there would be services at 11 o'clock in the church. This and other similar proceedings constigated, in the Colonel's view, a strong presumption that the vicar was a concealed papist, if not a Jesuit, and that Parkins, who could not very readily follow the Colonel in his region, did not agree, disagree with him. In fact, they got on so well together in the morning that there was no talk on either side of their separating after lunch. Both continued to play well during the afternoon, or at least well enough to make them forget everything else, until the light began to fail them. Not until then did Parkins remember that he had meant to do some more investigating at the preceptory. But it was of no great importance, he reflected. 
One day was as good as another and he may as well go home with the Colonel. As they turned the corner of the house, the Colonel was almost knocked down by a boy who rushed into him at the very top of his speed, and then instead of running away, remained hanging on to him and panting. The first words of this warrior were naturally those of reproof and objurgation, but he was very quickly discerned that the boy, who was almost speechless with fright, Inquiries were useless at first, but when the boy got his breath and began to howl and still clung on to the colonel's legs, he was at last detached but continued to howl. What in the world is the matter with you? What have you been up to? What have you seen? said the colonel. Oh, I've seen it. I've seen it waving me out the window, wailed the boy. I don't like it. I don't like it. What window? bristled the irritated colonel. Come, pull yourself together, my boy. Front window it was. Front window at the hotel, said the boy. Well, at this point, Parkins was in favour of sending the boy home, but the colonel refused. He wanted to get to the bottom of it, he said. It was most dangerous to give a boy such a fright as this one had had, and if it turned out that people had been playing jokes, they should suffer for it in some way. By a series of questions, he made out this story. The boy had been playing about on the grass at the front of the globe with some others. Then they'd gone home for their teas, and just as he was going, what he happened to look up and at the front window and see it waving at him. It seemed to be a figure of some sort in, in white, as far as he knew. He couldn't see its face, but it weaved at him. And it weren't a right thing. No, not a right person. Was there a light in the room? No. No, he didn't think to look if there was a light. And which was the window? Was it the top one? The second one? The second one in it was. The big window with the two little ones on each side. Very well, my boy, said the Colonel after a few more questions. You run away home. I expect it was some person trying to give you a start. Another time, like a brave little English boy, you just throw some stone. Well, no, not that exactly, but you go and you speak to the waiter or to Mr. Simpson, the landlord, and, and yes, you say that I advise you to do so. Well, the boy's face expressed some kind of doubt. He felt as to the likelihood of Mr. Simpson's lending a favourable ear to his complaint, but the Colonel did not appear to perceive this and went on, and, and here's a sixpence. No, I, no, I see it's a shilling. I'm going, and you be off home, and don't think any more about it. Well, the youth hurried off with agitated thanks, and the Colonel and Parkins went round to the front of the globe and reconnoitred. Well, there was only one window answering to the description that they'd been hearing. Well, that's curious, said Parkins. It's, it's evidently my window that the lad was talking about. Um, we... Will you come up for a moment, Colonel Wilson? We, we ought to be able to see if anyone's been taking liberties in my room. Well, they were soon in the passage, and Parkins made as if to open the door. And he stopped and felt in his pockets. Well, this this is more serious than I thought, was his next remark. I, I, I remember now that before I started this morning, I locked the door, and it it is locked now. And what is more, here's the key. He held it up. Now, he went on, if the servants are in the habit of going into one's rooms during the day when one is away, well, I can, well, I can only say that, well, I do not approve of it at all. Conscious of a somewhat weak climax, he busied himself in opening the door, which was indeed locked, and in lighting candles. No. No, he said, nothing disturbed. Well, except your bed, put in the colonel. Oh, ex excuse me, that isn't my bed. I, I don't use that one. But it, it does look as if someone's been playing tricks with it. It certainly did. The bedclothes were bundled up and twisted together in a most tortuous confusion. Parkins pondered. Well, that, that must be it, he said at last. Uh, I disordered the clothes last night in unpacking, and they haven't made it since. Perhaps they came in to make it, and the, the boy saw them through the window, and then they were called away and locked the door after them. Yes, I, I think that must be it. Well, ring and ask, 
said the Colonel, and this appealed to Parkins as practical. The maid appeared, and to make a long story short, deposed that she had made the bed in the morning when the gentleman was in the room, and she hadn't been there since. No, she hadn't no other key. Mr Simpson, he kept the key. He'd be able to tell if the gentleman, if anyone had been up. Well, this was a puzzle. Well, investigation showed that nothing of, val of value had been taken, and Parkins remembered the deposition of small objects on tables and so forth well enough to be well, pretty sure that no pranks had been played with them. Mr and Mrs Simpson, furthermore, agreed that neither of them had given the duplicate key to the room of any person during the day, nor could Parkins, fair-minded man as he was, detect anything in the demeanour of master or mistress or maid that indicated guilt. He was much more inclined to think that the boy had been imposing on the colonel. The latter was unwantedly silent and pensive at dinner, and throughout the evening, when he bade good night to Parkins, he muttered in a gruff overtone, You really know where I am if you need me during the night. Oh, why, yes, thank you, Colonel Wilson. I think I do, but there isn't much prospect of my disturbing you, I hope, by the way. Oh, did I, did I show you that old whistle I spoke to? Uh, I think not. Well, here it is. The Colonel turned it over gingerly in the light of the candle. Can you make anything of the inscription? As he took it back. No. Not in this light. What do you mean to do with it? Oh, well, when I get back to Cambridge, I shall submit it to some of the archaeologists there and see if see what they think of it. And very likely, if they consider it worth having, I may present it to one of the museums. Hmph, <laughs> said the Colonel. Well, you might be right. All I know is that if it were mine, I should chuck it straight into the sea. It's no use talking, I'm well aware, but I expect that with you it's a case of live and learn. Well, I hope so. I'm sure. Well, I wish you a good night. He turned away, leaving Parkins in act to speak at the bottom of the stairs. And soon, each was in his own bedroom. Well, by, by some unfortunate accident, there were neither blinds nor curtains in the windows of the professor's room. The previous night he'd thought little of this, but tonight there seemed to be every prospect of a bright moon rising to shine directly onto his bed and probably wake him later. When he noticed that uh, he was a good deal annoyed, but with an ingenuity that I can only envy, he succumbed in rigging up, with the help of a, a railway rug, some safety pins, a stick and a, an umbrella, a screen which, if it only held together, would completely keep the moonlight off his bed. Shortly afterwards, he was comfortably in that bed. When he read a somewhat solid work, long enough to produce the decided wish for sleep, he cast a, a drowsy glance around the room, blew out the candle, and fell back onto the pillow. He must have slept soundly for an hour or more, when a sudden clatter shook him up in a most unwelcome manner. In a moment, he realised what had happened. The, he care, the carefully constructed screen had given way. And a very bright, frosty moon was shining directly on his face. Well, this was highly annoying. Could he possibly get up and reconstruct the screen? Or could he manage to sleep if he did not? For some minutes, he lay pondering over the possibilities. And then he turned over sharply. And with... With his eyes open, he lay breathlessly listening. There had been a movement, he was sure, in, in, in the empty bed on the opposite side of the room. Well, tomorrow he'd have it moved, for them, there must be rats or something playing about. But it was quiet now. No. No, the commotion began again. There, were, there was a, a, a rustling and a shaking more than any rat could cause. I can figure to myself something of the professor's bewilderment and horror, for, for I had a dream some thirty years back, the same sort of thing. But the reader will hardly perhaps imagine how dreadful it was for the professor to see a figure suddenly sit up in what he had known to be an empty bed. He was out of his own bed in one sound and made a dash towards the window where lay his only weapon, the stick 
with which he'd propped open the screen. This was, as it turned out, the worst thing he could have done, because the personage in the empty bed with a sudden smooth motion slipped from the bed and took up a position with an outstretched arms between the two beds and in front of the door. Parkins watched in a horrid perplexity. Somehow the idea of getting past it and escaping through the door was intolerable to him. He could not have borne it. He didn't know why. To touch it. Or to have it touching him. Well, he'd sooner dash himself through the window than have that happen. It stood for the moment in the band of dark shadow. He'd not seen what its face was like. And now it began to move in a stooping posture. All at once the spectator realised with some horror and some relief that it must be blind, for it seemed to feel about it with its muffled arms in a groping random fashion. Turning half away from him, it suddenly became conscious of the bed he'd just left. It, it darted towards it, bent over and felt the pillows in a way which made Parkin shudder as he had never in his life thought possible. In a very few moments, seemed to know that the bed was empty and then moving forward into the area of light and facing the window it showed for the first time what manner of thing it was Parkins who very much dislikes being questioned about it did once describe something of it in my hearing and I gathered that, that what he chiefly remembers about it is a horrible an intensely horrible face of crumpled linen. What expression he read upon it, he could not or will not tell. But the fear of it went nigh to maddening him in certain. But he was not at leisure to watch it for long. With formidable quickness it moved into the middle of the room and as it groped and waved, one corner of its draperies swept across Parkin's face. He could not, though he knew how perilous a sound was, he could not keep back a cry of disgust. And this gave the search an instant clue. It leapt towards him upon the instant, and the next moment he was halfway through the window, backwards, uttering cry upon cry at the utmost pitch of his voice. And the linen face was thrust close into his own. At this, almost the last possible sound deliverance came. And as you will have guessed, the colonel burst through the door and was just in time to see the dreadful group at the window. When he reached the figures, only one was left. Parkin sank forward into the room in a faint, and before him on the floor lay a tumbled heap of bedclothes. Colonel Wilson asked no questions, but busied himself in keeping everyone else out of the room and in getting Parkins back into bed, and himself, wrapped in a rug, occupied the other bed for the rest of the night. Early on the next day, Rogers arrived, more welcome than he would have been the day before, and the three of them held a very long consultation in the professor's room. At the end of it, the colonel left the hotel door, carrying a small object between his finger and thumb. He cast it into the sea, as far as a very brawny arm could send it. Later on, the smoke of a burning ascended from the back premises of the globe. Exactly what explanation was patched up for the staff and visitors at the hotel, I must confess, I do not recollect. The professor was somehow cleared of the ready suspicion of deliberum tremens, and the hotel of the reputation of a troubled house. Well, there's not much question as to what would have happened with Parkins and the Colonel if he'd not have intervened when he did. He would either have fallen out of the window or else lost his wits. But it's not so evident what more the creature that came to answer to the whistle could have done than to frighten. There seemed to be absolutely nothing material about it save the bedclothes of which it had made itself into a body. The Colonel who remembered a not dissimilar occurrence in India, was of the opinion that if Parkins had closed with it, well, could really have done very little, and that its one power was that of frightening. The whole thing, he said, served to confirm his opinion of the Church of Rome. There really is nothing more to tell. 
As you can imagine, the professor's views on certain points are less clear-cut than they used to be. His nerves, too, have suffered. He cannot even now see a surplus hanging on a door quite unmoved, and the spectacle of a scarecrow in a field late on a winter's afternoon has cost him more than one sleepless night.